She is a member of the Illinois College Sports Hall of Fame. I didn't look up to see how many points or how many kills she made against Monmouth College if she played here. But anyway, she was good. Tonight, she addresses the Wiswell Robeson Lecture on the subject, Perspectives on the Future of Rural America. Please welcome 17th, 17th District U.S. Representative Sherry Brewster. And she represented a lot of farmers and their estates. And 
she starts telling me about how she has had more concerning meetings with the family farmers in our region than she can ever remember having. She talked about all of the instability with the weather that we had. We were finishing up, not, if you remember that timing of that, we had gone through some flooding. You don't have that derecho that went through Iowa and then into Illinois. Um, but she said that the, the conversation that she was having with many of the family farmers were that they did not know if they wanted, if they were going to be able to pass their farm on to their next generation. It was that dire. They were not sure if they were going to be able to, and then they would follow that up by even if they wanted to. They, so they started to question, if you think about it, how many, uh, do we have any five generation farm families in the audience? Gene, Gene, Gene. Um, four generation. Yeah, that's like our family. Three, three generations. Yeah, okay. So, so you, you guys, you know what I'm talking about, though. And um, so I left that meeting, and, and my chief of staff, who used to work with the USDA, who was from Canton, Illinois, out of Fulton County, um, we kind of we, we had a sit down after that and said, "Gosh, I've never." seeing this kind of reaction to what's going on right now. Um, and so um, I share that with you because I'm guessing maybe some of you have either felt that or heard friends talk about that um, or have some concern about that, depending on what the year is. So when we talked about this being the future of, of ag and the future of, of rural America, um, I want to say that it doesn't have to be that way. I don't think we have to have that concern. We have to get to a place where that is not the way our family farmers are feeling. Um, and I believe it's about access to resources that our, our farm families and our rural families need. Um, and that includes things like our health providers. Anybody here work in healthcare? Just, just one person. We know in our smaller towns, we, we got, this is an issue we have to address. Um, teachers, we have any teachers in the audience? Okay, several. All of my aunts, every single one of my aunts on my mom's side of the family and my dad's side of the family, we're all, uh, we're all teachers as well. But teachers in our rural areas, it is a real issue. We have a huge shortage, even with the consolidation, which has taken away some of our identity, right? But we still have an issue. I'm guessing every one of the teachers who raised your hands or who's worked in education, you've gone through a lot over the last year and a half. You've gone through a lot. But we have a teacher shortage issue that we can address as well. Um, I went to, anybody go to the Farm Progress Show last week? Okay. Uh, um, really, I walked away from that so encouraged. There is so much through innovation that we are going to be able to do, whether it's you know farming techniques or land conservation or carbon sequestration. Does anybody know where what's beneath us right now? Anybody know what's beneath us right now besides the floor? Oh, besides, okay, under the soil? Okay, it's the, it's the Mount Simon sandstone basin. And it literally covers three quarters of the state of Illinois. And the reason I mention that is because ADM has invested, along with some partners, about $300 million to figure out how we're going to get carbon into that. You guys, we are well situated for, for doing so much through carbon sequestration through, through your own farmland cover crops, no-till, um, the sandstone basin. We, we are, we're sitting on tight, top of something that can be really, really meaningful from, a, from a, uh, an economic perspective. Um, so I'm here to say that we've got a lot ahead of us that we can tap into that's going to be very, that can be very meaningful. Um, so Ken did a nice job of explaining a little bit about my background. Let me go into a little bit more, just so maybe it'll give you a little street cred, or maybe it won't, I don't know. But um, I grew up in Springfield, Illinois. So I did not grow up on a farm. However, um, Ken mentioned my grandfather, a guy named Joe Callahan, who was a uh, hog farmer, this is my uncle, Myron Erdman. They're dairy farmers out of Shenoa, Illinois. My grandpa was in Milford, Illinois, Iroquois County. Um, 
almost to the, uh, the Indiana state line. Um, and I've got uh, cousins who have Angus. They all grow corn and beans. This is everybody on my dad's side of the family. These are my family roots. And the reason I share that with you is because every member of Congress, um, and for that matter, Ken, you know this, but um, anybody else here, an elected official, past or present? Um, Ken, Sheila, You guys should try it, it's really so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I don't care what you serve it, whether it's on the city council, the county board, in Congress, we're all products of where we're from, our background, how we're raised. And so when I was first elected and made a decision to serve on the Ag Committee, um, it's because of my upbringing. This is me. I'm that girl that looks like a boy on the far right. Um, I'm, I'm sitting on my grandpa's, this is in Milford, Illinois, um, sitting on, the, on his fence. My sister's on the far, far left, and as I look at her, she kind of looks like a boy too. And then my cousin, uh, Kathy, they were, uh, they were cattle farmers. They, uh, she was in the middle. And, um, but, but, but we are where we come from. And so I wanted to make sure that I served on the Ag Committee on day one. And in my, all five terms, I have served on the Ag Committee. And that's been really important. I have been able to be a voice for the folks back home when I head back out to, to Washington. Um, I've never lived in a major metropolitan city ever in my life. I've never lived in Chicago, never lived in LA, never lived in New York, any of that. Um, in, in fact, um, I, I'm trying to think of the, I guess Springfield's the biggest town I've ever lived in, where that I left there when I was 18 years old to go away to school. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, so it's those roots and, you know, but, uh, you know, when my colleagues go home and they talk about what's going on in Brooklyn or Queens or, or LA, um, they're not doing this kind of stuff. And so, um, the, the other part that's unique about this, and just try to understand, like the voice that I take with me to Washington, um, there are only three Democrats. I'm not getting political here, but I'm just trying to explain the political landscape. Um, when, we were, when we were talking about the stepped up basis, and I'm happy to address that in a little bit because I hear it everywhere I go. Um, and the concern was, what did you say? How many districts are, are farm districts? Yeah. How many? Yeah. Ten. Okay. So the concern is, who's got your back, right? Um, so just just for a little perspective, as far as like the Democrat goes, I'm trying to paint like a little bit of the political landscape. There are only three Democrats, three Democrats in all of the U.S. House of Representatives, 435 members, right? There are three Democrats who won in 2016 and won in 2020 in districts that Donald Trump also won. All right, so three, and I happen to be one of them. All right, so um, I have a voice in Washington because of that district that I come from. I had a Nebraska farmer come up to me and say, you're a political unicorn. Um, because it is unusual. If you think about it, if you're going to vote at the top of the ticket, um, and in 2016, I won by 20 points. It was the biggest margin in, the unit, in, in America for a Democrat in a Trump district. Um, so that helped me, though, when I go out to Washington and I say to the Speaker of the House, I want to be on appropriations, which is, included, which is considered an exclusive committee. You can only serve on one committee if you're on appropriations. And I said, but I still want to serve on ag. Made it happen. Um, so I now chair what I consider the most important subcommittee on the House Ag Committee, which is the General Farm Commodities and Risk Management. Anybody here use crop insurance? Been called crop insurance? Okay, well that goes through this subcommittee that I'm on. And when you talked about being on the conference committee, Ken, um, for the last Farm Bill, the 2018 Farm Bill, I was part of that final negotiation, which I think we got in a pretty good place. I can tell you that after um, I was on the 2014 Farm Bill, I, both, I was uh, not on the conference committee, but I helped negotiate that as well. And, um, but this is a subcommittee where the, uh, the CCC goes through. I mean, it is, it, it's an important voice. Um, I'm also a member of the Rural Broadband Task Force. And I want to talk about a little bit about that and what that's going to mean 
in rural America. Um, we are, I, I'm also on what's called the Rural Reinvestment Task, Task Force. I just went to Iowa last week with my co-chair, a woman named Cindy Axting, to uh, talk, uh, to do listening sessions. We did round tables with our family farmers to say, what do you want us to know before we head back out to Washington, D.C.? So that's a little bit of background where I come from, a little bit about the, the voice that I take to Washington, D.C. Um, look, we're, we're in a new era right now. We've got a new president. Um, he is um, partnering with Tom Vilsack in a very close way. He personally wanted Tom Vilsack to come back as Secretary of Agriculture because they worked together for eight years in the Obama administration. And Tom Vilsack is a strong partner with that. He understands the folks here tonight, you know, in Iowa. He understands corn, he understands, he understands soybeans. Um, the, the underlying foundation for the policy that Secretary Vilsack and President Biden are looking at from a rural perspective um, really have the climate is an underlying philosophy on, like, whether you look at infrastructure, whether you look at ag policy, whether you look at um, the economy overall. And so we have to look for, when I, when I talk about that Mount Simon sand basin, that's important for our region because that plays into the climate and it plays into what this administration sees as important right now. Um, I consider it one of the, um, one of the pressing issues that we're facing in our country. This is me by a solar panel in the northern part of our congressional district. But literally, if you think about it, climate's impacting everything that we're doing, whether it's droughts or whether it's floods, whether it's these early frosts that we, we've seen. Um, but, but again, after leaving the, the Farm Progress Show, there are innovative programs that are out there um, as it pertains to decarbonization, to land preservation, that we're going to be able to tap into. Um, so let's talk uh, biofuels for a second. Um, I, I'm going to actually broaden it uh, for a minute. Do you guys remember a uh, climate plan that came out a few years ago that criticized farmers and talked about um, airplanes and cattle and methane? Just, I'm, I'm not using the profane words that were part of that because my mom would never let me say that word. But, um, so, so I remember it really well, and if you if you remember where it was written, it it came from uh, urban America, right? It came out of a, from an urban lawmaker, and I just remember reading that and thinking, what the heck? I mean, we, we here in middle America, um, we don't need everybody's finger pointing at us as if we're the bad guy all the time, and. We also want to make sure that we have a seat at the table when we're talking about climate. And so I wrote something called the Rural Green Partnership. And um, basically what it is is a framework of policies from an agriculture and a rural perspective. And if anybody wants to read it, I'm happy to send it to anybody. It's not a 500-page you know, document or anything like that. It's a framework for making sure that we in farm country, have a seat at the table, and we say that we can be part of the solution. So it's looking at everything from precision agriculture, from again carbon sequestration to no till no till farming. And in our research, uh, I found out that 71 percent of the farms in this congressional district use no till farming or reduced till farming practices. So we're already, you know, we're, we're already doing pretty well about that. Um, but we in, in Things like strengthening our renewable fuel standards, all of that is part of our rural green partnership. Um, and if we are going to address the climate in a real way, it is going to take a whole of America response. And we don't want this just to be folks on the coast saying this is what we're going to do. Um, I, I testified before the um, House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, which is the go-to committee that is writing the policy on how we're going to address this. And they included uh, many of our final recommendations in their report. And so really proud that we've been able to carve out a part of our part of the country to include in this. This was at the Farm Progress Show. Did anybody see that gene? Anybody who went 
that uh, runs on E85. Um, it, was, it was really pretty awesome. Did they start it up for you? Yeah, it was, it was like really awesome. If you like big, big vehicles, um, it was, I'll tell you what, it was, it was something else. So, um, you know, so the, the, these innovative practices that are coming out, um, look, I live literally less than a mile from where all of the combines that John Deere makes are made. Um, my father-in-law built combines, my brother-in-law built combines, and um, I, I was amazed at some of the innovation that is coming out of John Deere. Um, if, if you, who, who just ordered a new combine? Yeah, what, I, I, I'm guessing the price tag is not cheap. I'm a half Only a half a million. Only half a million. But I mean, is it amazing? Can it do things that you've never seen done before? I was amazed. I think it's going to be very, I'm going to have one of the younger guys running. <laughs> 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 if you didn't hear that, he's going to have one of the younger guys running. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing the, the, the precision that these machines um, use now. Absolutely amazing. Um, so another, another presentation that I sat through, how they're looking at biologicals now that you plant, that it's, it's a liquid that you put down with the, the, the corn plant and that it wraps around the roots of the, the corn plant so you don't have to use um, uh, ammonia. You don't have to use the, and, and how, how do you say it? Nice. Thank you. Um, and, and so there's no runoff. And uh, this is something that, that Pioneer is looking at, that it's, these startups are looking at. Um, there, another, uh, just down the road a little ways is Calvin Cornheads. They've invented this chopper gadget that literally chops up the corn stalk into kind of confetti as opposed to just the, the long, longer corn stalk. So it's, it's better for the soil. Um, the, now they're talking about nanotechnology. So literally something that can be put in the corn plant that talks about if it needs more water, less water, more nutrients, less nutrients, if it needs energy, what the energy levels are. All of this, this is, this is what's going on right now. These are all economic opportunities. And so I, the future of agriculture is bright. And whether you went to that Farm Progress show or not, it is bright. We're looking at that, um, we, we talked a little bit when, when I was with some of the uh, folks earlier today on campus, they talked about young farmers. Um, this woman right here, her name is Dusty Spurgeon. She's a 2010 graduate of Monmouth College. And she is farming uh, 10 acres in Rio and Galesburg. And she has a community sustainability agriculture program. So she grows and picks every day. And then those who subscribe to this program will come and get their vegetables. Um, and this is something like for a young, and she's able to su help support her family on this. Um, and then the same day, I promise I don't wear that same shirt all the time, but the same day I head over to, to Peoria, and this gentleman right here on, on the left picture, he uh, buys up lots in Peoria that have these dilapidated houses on them. He buys them for a dollar tears down the houses, so he's clearing blight out of what's considered one of the toughest zip codes in the entire nation for people. It's higher crime, it's a food desert, the only grocery store, the only store there was Kroger and it closed. The only pharmacy was the CVS and it closed. They have a high dropout rate in high school, they have high poverty, they have high crime. So this guy's buying up these lots for a dollar, tearing down the houses, getting rid of these ugly places that are boarded up, or um, he said there was, a, there was a neighbor across the street where they had cockfighting, where they had drug dealing, and um, he's then using these to plant fruits and vegetables. And then he's selling them at a farmer's market, or he's giving them to people. They have to pay a fee too. He said when you give things away, there's not value. So, there's a, there's a little bit of money that's exchanging. Um, and but, but this is an answer like for people who really want to go into farming but in a different way, this is something
something that is happening. In fact, in the state of Illinois, there was just a bill that passed, and the governor has signed it into law, that is, uh, looks at urban agricultural zones. I knew nothing about this until a week ago. Urban agricultural zones. And so what happens is, again, anybody can buy these lots for a dollar. They then have to keep up on the lots. And the sales tax that is received from any of the sales from these urban agricultural zones go, go into a designated fund for the city or the county to buy more land where you could, where we as a state can help prevent more of these food deserts. Now we're kind of in the land of plenty. This. And for those of you who were at the show, did you guys hear me talk about the Next Generation Fuels Act? Don't fall too loud. Okay, well, I'm pretty excited about it. And so I'm going to uh, tell you about what the Next Generation Fuels Act is. Um, it's a bill that I wrote. That's why I'm really excited about it. Um, <laughs> but uh, here's what it would do. And this idea actually came out of the Ag Roundtable we did with Vanessa Wetterling, where um, it, it came up that we've got to have the car manufacturers involved in not just looking at an all-electric fleet. You guys have all heard that in us, right? Did, was it a little startling? That the, those who, we, we've got seven refineries uh, in and around this congressional district. Gene Youngquist knows this. Seven refineries in and around this congressional district. So when you hear about an all-electric fleet, it's like, what? We better do something about that. So what, here's just what this bill does. It would require the vehicle manufacturers, so I think GM type companies, to manufacture their vehicles. So in the first five years of implementation, they could burn E20. And the fueling stations then have to have the equipment that can pump because you got it, it burns high, hot, so you got to have the right equipment, then that they have the right equipment to fill those vehicles with E20, E25, E30. Um, there is a, a, a date that all of this has to be done, and this might surprise you, but of the, I don't know if we still call it the big three car, man, car manufacturers, because now we have Ford, we have GM, and what's the, there's like what a, French owned or German owned, I don't even know what that one's called anymore that makes some of the others. But um, one of the big three, and we're working on another one, is supportive of this and wants this to happen. I didn't think that was going to happen. Um, the UAW, United Auto Workers, that builds these cars just endorsed it within the last several days. The Farm Bureau supported it. The corn growers are supported. Um, this is something that, um, here's why it's so good. And here's why politically we are going to be able, I hope, to be able to get support. Um, so we increase ethanol in fuel supply. I think in, most people in this room would agree that that's a good thing. We create jobs as a result of this. That's why the UAW is supportive. This, is a, this would be a whole new way of building some of the cars. And it reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 40%. 40%. So the way I look at this from a political perspective, if you have to think back to the point of if we've only got a limited number of members of Congress who come from, you know, corn country, um, most Democrats are very excited about being able to bring down greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, emissions. So, so I see this as a way that we can get support for this. Uh, the bill was introduced just a couple weeks ago. It's been assigned to the Energy and Commerce Committee. Our next goal is to be able to get that through the committee and then get it attached to another bill or a standalone bill. Look, I, I, I'm not trying to understate the difficulty of getting a bill that is, would, would be changing things to this level. Um, I don't want to downplay it and, and say this is easy because it's not. But we have some key endorsement from, from folks. Um, the CEO of Growth Energy said of this bill, it's a clear roadmap for turbocharging our progress against climate change. So when you're talking to more urban lawmakers, if you're in many conversations like that, that's, that's the approach to take, and that creates job. The Illinois Farm Bureau said it was a win for farmers, for motorists, for the rural economy. So um, we're going to do what we can to move this along. 
Um, you know, so, so we don't just need a, a strong agricultural economy. We also need to make sure that we have strong rural communities. Um, and as I said earlier, we've got, uh, we have, we have uh, issues with teacher shortages that we have to address. We have legislation to help do that. In fact, in a bill that we're going to be negotiating later this month, we address the teacher shortage issue. Broadband, anybody here have a problem with high-speed internet where they live? Just a couple, you know, usually it's like, raise your hand, because I, I, I gotta take the stories back. Okay, um, I love, I, I actually really like hearing these stories. When I was in Whiteside County, um, there was a woman, uh, they, they had a cattle, and they had to have three different setups in order to get internet. They had to have this antenna on top of one of the grain silos. They had to, um, they had to subscribe to some other service, but then that one got really, really expensive, then they had to have a backup service to that. I mean, there's, these are just common stories, whether it's the kids who have to sit outside their high school uh, to, to be able to finish a paper and they're doing it on their phone, um, the kids who have to sit on the student at the library to be able to access it. Um, we have a goal and we have a piece of legislation, if we can get this passed, to make sure that everybody in America has high-speed internet by 2025. Um, so it is realistic, it has bipartisan support. The, the, uh, the Rural Broadband Task Force that I serve on it is our, uh, our highest priority and we have high-level people within the House who are supportive of it. Um, but again, uh, th these are things that we have to make sure that we are working on together. You know, th this is just an overlay of how like a grid looks. That's just a, a depiction there, but I, I, I showed that to you to, to let you know. That's why I was surprised more hands didn't go up. In our congressional district, one in four families don't have access to the internet at all. One in four families in this congressional district. So think about that. How, how do you run your small business? How do the kids do their homework? During this pandemic, when it was hard for people to get out, how do they access health care? So these are all real issues, and they are, they are severe. So there's going to have to be a federal investment in this, not just the high-speed internet, just not the ethernet, the, the, that last mile connection, even cell phone towers. There's going to have to be a federal investment in this because there is not a business case for these companies to do it when our people are spread out and it's more rural. Um, we have a plan for this. Um, we already passed something that, um, for those who can access it, we've got a, a $50 a month, um, uh, I guess, uh, tax credit to, to help people who can't afford it, afford that. Um, but, but literally, the, the pandemic drew a curtain on this and the importance of making sure that that um, we have access to this. And it is, it is among the highest priorities of members of Congress from all over this country because everybody has these issues in their congressional district. You know, really, no matter where they live, it's either an affordability problem or it's an accessibility problem. Okay, we talked about teacher shortages. Um, low teacher pay. The teachers in the room, are, are, is pay what it should be? No. Not even close. You know, you think about who we are. I'm, I'm the, my husband and I have three boys. They're all grown now. We now have three grandkids. I told you all of my aunts were uh, teachers, all retired teachers now. Um, teachers are so underpaid for what you do. And we're entrusting our children with you. You have such a hard job. Um, kids in rural areas have been disproportionately impacted by the teacher shortage issue. And you have to look at the pay as part of that teacher shortage issue. And then how we honor our teachers. Um, you know, people want to be honored when they're working in an honorable profession. They want to feel like um, that others know how important their job is. And uh, so we've got a, a piece of legislation that's called Retaining Educators takes added investment now. And what it does is create a fully refundable tax credit for teachers. And then the longer they stay, for example, in rural areas, that increases. So, um, you know, again, there are legislative answers to this. Here at Mama, um, they've got the, and, and 
uh, President White could talk about this all day long, but the, the Tartan's Rural Teacher Corps. Guys, this, this is real innovative stuff that's coming out of this college right here. A recognition that we've got to do something about making sure that we've got rural teachers and that they're honored. Um, they've been, you've been able to uh, train teachers to basically prepare for uh, working in, in rural school districts. So um, I, I want to applaud uh, President, uh, um, uh, our, our, our president and his leadership for all of the work that you've done um, on this issue. And it is something that is really, really important and, and uh, should be applauded. So uh, President White, thank you for, for uh, taking this on. Um, we, as we look ahead, um, when I go back out to Washington, I, we go back on the 20th, we're going to be voting a week later on the infrastructure bill. Um, you guys have heard about that. This is the bipartisan bill that came out of the Senate. And um, it will be the biggest investment in infrastructure since the Dwight Eisenhower administration. Was anybody alive during that administration? <laughs> <laughs> so you remember when the uh, interstate highway system was developed in this country? I mean, it was a game changer, right? Um, I, I don't think probably anybody remembers the development of the Monty Dam system, because that will, you know, maybe, I don't know. Um, but from the, the, the Depression era, we had investments in that ahead of us. We were able to get tens of millions of dollars of moving along some of the projects on our last and end. This is critically important to get our commodities to market. Um, so that is going to be voted on on September 27th. That's the bipartisan bill. I think we're going to pass that. And thank you. Um, and then we have the other part that's called the Build Back Better Act. That is the bigger package. Um, what, what's in there is there are, uh, it's taking a look at early childhood education. It is taking a look at um, how public education is structured very differently. So um, three and four year olds would now have, pre-K would be part of our public education system. Um, um, I showed you this old abandoned school, Harrison School in, in Peoria. Because I think in other things, I, I drive all around this congressional district. Um, and I take a lot of the back roads. Uh, you know, we have towns, the, the, the smallest town that I can think of is a town called Hamlet, Illinois, in Mercer County. It's population 48. Does anybody know a smaller town than that? Because if you do, I would love to know it. I actually, I actually knocked the door uh, on every, every single house in Hamlet because I was wondering, what's Hamlet all about? Who lives here? Um, it's mostly farm families, um, and they mostly were not of my political party. In fact, I don't know if any of them were. But um, but we had some nice uh, we had some nice conversations when I was knocking doors. It was right after uh, John McCain passed away, and uh, there, there's a woman riding her John Deere tractor down the middle of the road, and she recognized me. and She said, "What are you doing in town?" And I said, "I just I said I've just always been curious about curious about Hamlet, and um, I was wondering who lived here." And uh, she said, and I said, I'm just knocking doors and saying hello to people and just seeing what they want you to know before I head back out to Washington. And she said, well, in the last house as you drive out of town, can you stop by? Um, and I said, yeah. I said, yeah, that'll be my last place. And so I go there, and, and um, we pour it again, and I uh, toast to John McCain, and that's how I ended my trip to Hamlet, Illinois, talking to 48 people who live there. Um, so it was, it was a lovely, lovely, lovely trip. But I bring that up to you because I don't care where I go, whether it's Hamlet, whether it's Rockford, whether it's Peoria, whether it's uh, parts of Monmouth, there are boarded up buildings. They, some of them might be downtown. And you can tell that it was a beautiful structure at one point. Or it might just be a house that whoever lived there couldn't afford to keep it up anymore and it's overrun by weeds and um, broken windows and that sort of thing. And I think this is something that has to be addressed. And some of it is just like on a community level. but. Um, in, in the whole country, the cities of Peoria and Rockford have among the highest rates of abandoned foreclosures in the entire nation. And this is right here in our state. It's in our congressional district. So um, we have a program where there is uh, $25 million for this competitive grant program. And I bring that to your attention because these are the kind of things that um, 
local communities can make, they have to apply for this money. But I, I think that if there are abandoned homes or buildings in whatever the rural town is where you live, um, I, I think we're better off trying to take care of that. And I think it's part of rural life that we want, we want to make sure things look good. I show you this one because we were able to get a grant and pass it out of the House that's over in the Senate now to tear this down. And it has been a community priority for them for many, many years. So um, I, I tell President Wyden, like in, in his senior leadership team, call me. I'm going to do that. Um, look, I think it's the private sector here at, we're at one of the ethanol plants. I think it's academia. I think it's government. I think it's the faith community. I think it's our nonprofits. Um, whether it's things like grants or loans or tax credits, um, we've got to be able to uh, help address these things together. Um, look, I, I don't know how many people or who in this audience voted for Joe Biden, um, but he's our president now, and um, and I, I admire him, and I have high hopes for his administration. Here's what I can tell you. I like to say that God gave us two ears and one mouth, and we should use them proportionately. And I think that's really important. Um, and I can tell you that I work with a lot of people that maybe weren't told that as a child. Um, but, but Joe Biden does care about our part of the country. I can tell you he cares about our part of the country. Tom Vilsack cares about our part of the country. Um, he has a proposal to have a, it's a rural partnership program that we provide flexible spending to local nonprofits and community leaders because he knows that the local nonprofits know what the issues are on the ground. And I think those are the kind of programs that we have to look at. You know, we're, we're looking at investing in public schools, um, whether that be uh, dilapidated schools or bad um, ventilation because of dealing with this COVID that we have to invest in. But there's money that we want to make sure that we have to help our public schools. Um, we've got to lower the price of prescription drugs. And part of that is going to be allowing Medicare to finally negotiate the price of prescription drugs. So we can do more with Medicare. But we have to do that to be able to do that too. Um, so the, the infrastructure uh, package, the, this right here, um, that I'm looking at with a construction worker here, that's the new I-74 bridge that goes from Moline, Illinois to Davenport, or to Bethel, Ohio. And I look at this, I live on the Mississippi River. So I live on River Drive. So I say the Mississippi River is my front drive, my front door. So I literally can look out my front window and see this. I've seen it go up over the last several years. And when I see this, I know what's behind it. Every, every one of those cranes, I count those cranes when I take a walk along the river. And with every one of those cranes, it means jobs, it means better transportation, and with this infrastructure package that we are going to pass, I hope on this 27th of September, um, that's going to create 2 million jobs for each of the next 10 years. So if you think about it, if you have any bridges that have been out and you had to take detours, um, if you think about some of those skinny two-lane roads where there are way too many accidents, crashes that have happened, uh, those are the kind of things that um, I hope that we can address through this major, this major um, investment. We'll have $65 billion for rural broadband. That's what it's going to cost. We have to map this. We have to build it out. We have to make sure that we get that to every corner of this country. So, um, look, I think that if, if there's a moral of the story here, is that there's a lot of policies that address just virtually everything. Um, but it takes a lot of compromise. It takes a lot of working together. Um, if you follow what's going on in Washington, D.C., it is uh, a very tough atmosphere these days. Um, about 90 plus percent, 90 plus percent of the bills that I've introduced on day one are bipartisan. And again, that's that, um, the district that I come from, because the way I look at it is none of you, I don't mean none of you did, but would have voted for me um, if I'm too crazy left, um, because it's not what our politics are here. And 
So it, it really is a matter of figuring out how we're going to work together at a local level, at a state level, at a federal level. I'm wondering if maybe we shouldn't be trying to focus on encouraging them to change the way they operate, number one. And the second question is a, a broader question. I've never, and I'm 69 years old, seen the disconnect and partisanship in Washington that I perceive now. And I know it's dysfunctional, and people are voting party lines whether they want to or not. My question is, why does Washington think they can spend our tax money better than we can as individuals? Well, we probably can't, but it's our job. Um, so representative is uh, not only my job title, but also my job responsibility, right? I mean, we're, we're elected, it's the way our government's set up. Um, each congressional district in this country, we represent somewhere around 700,000 people. And, um, you know, it is our job to represent those in our, in our congressional district, just as it is if you're a state senator or a state rep to represent your interests down in Springfield. Um, Look, I, I think it, it's why I, I said God gave us two ears and one mouth and we should use it proportionally. I, since I've been elected, I do something up until COVID, every, virtually every Saturday that I would call Supermarket Saturday, and just I would go out, not to do my grocery shopping, but to ask people what was on their mind, what did they want me to know before I head back to Washington. Um, I do another thing where um, I call it Sherry on Shift, where I job shadow people. Um, I harvested um, with, um, with one of our family farmers. I've processed carp out of the Mississippi River. I've changed street bulbs 30 feet up in a cherry picker. I've poured steel into bowls. I've, been a, I've forged steel, um, done 107 of these. And, um, and again, I told you my background. And so I just, I can't speak for the other 434 members, but um, that's how I've approached my job as a representative. And, um, try to vote the way that best serves people. That it is, we're a representative form of government. We are in a democracy, thank God. And I'm gonna do everything I can to help preserve this democracy, um, despite assaults on it. And um, so, I, I guess that would be my answer. But I think the best way to represent people is to listen to them and to try to take their voices there. Um, you are well preserved <coughs> for 69 years old. You look very good. And as far as uh, China goes, um, yeah, I mean, this is a global, you know, it's, it's, it's a global issue. We were part of the, I don't want to see that go away. And so, um, but I, I think we're going to have to adapt with, with our climate to look at policies that make sense. So, um, I don't think that's what you wanted to hear, but that's my view. <laughs> and I'm not running for re-election, so. <laughs> so if I didn't make that, you don't have to vote for it. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, right back there. Um, I'm wondering, renting pasture or pasture land, he cannot, he can barely get people to buy his cattle without fighting because he's a small farmer. Um, the farm we were on could no longer sell their hogs because they had to come from the big hog producers. Um, I'm just curious how much this is taken into account when you know we see a disproportionate, disproportionate number of acres being bought up by a few wealthy people. Yeah, it's. Um, I don't know, and I, I, I would love to hear from folks in the audience as far as how it's being handled at a local level when these bigger corporations come in. Does anybody speak out? Does anybody um, talk about this? Is, is there a reluctance to sell to corporate farms? I mean, it, it's kind of like the, you know, for those who don't want government to interfere, um, what is the answer? Um, because we know it's happening. And, I, and we've also got, now we have foreign purchase of farmland, which I think is a big concern. Um, I've actually talked with our legislative team about taking a look at, I, I want an assessment of what land is being bought up 
by foreign interests. I want to know how many acres are being bought. I want to know what's in the pipeline. I want to know if we should have policy. I'm told that if, you, if, if any of us wanted to go over to Germany and buy land, we couldn't do it because we're not German. We're Americans. But we've got all kinds of foreign interests that are coming over here. Um, so I think it, it needs to be addressed, especially the foreign interest. As far as the, the bigger corporate interest, I welcome your ideas on that. Um, that's a little bit tougher to, to manage from a legislative perspective. But um, I, I definitely, I, and I have not seen any study on what's going on with uh, foreign buyers of our farmland. But I, but I want to, I, so um, I will, I'll report back to you, but I've got, we've, we've got research to do to get this figured out. I, again, I welcome ideas. But I know it's a problem. Is Robin Johnson here? Robin brought that, the, the corporate purchase of farmland up to me. Probably when I was first running, I mean, a bill that came out of the Senate that uh, passed 99 to 0. Now, it was, it was advisory language, it was not legislation that would exempt our family farmers on um, making sure that they, that they are not going to fall into the same category as um, the, the biggest um, know, states in the, in the country. So it would exempt family farmers and it would exempt small business owners. Um, I wrote a letter along with 11 of my colleagues to uh, the White House saying that we wanted to make sure that our family farmers were exempt. That, uh, you know, I heard so many stories again, that's why I asked you earlier on how many third generation farmers do we have, fourth generation, fifth generation. Because we know when that farmland was bought, make sure that our family farmers are exempt. Um, the, the message has been delivered loudly and clearly. And um, we will make sure that um, we go yelling and kicking and screaming if that starts easing back into the conversation. So I feel pretty good where we are right now. Um, I, um, I, I think we've done a pretty good pre-work to make sure that, um, that our, our family farmers are exempt. And I, I want to do a, a shout out really to the, to the Farm Bureau. I think that the message has been delivered loudly and clearly when I did my 13 sessions with the, we had 13 farm bureaus in this congressional district. And um, all 13 brought up the stepped up basis, like without exception. And so the, the message was delivered very loudly. Um, as far as uh, the next package, and when we're looking at this spending, we're throwing around very, very big numbers, this trillion dollar infrastructure package, again, the biggest investment since um, just after World War II, um, and even the other bigger package that's being talked about right, right now would be completely paid for. This, there, not, there would not be new debt accrued for this. How is that done? It would be for families making over $400,000 a year. Their tax rates would go up. If you make less than $400,000 a year, you would not. Go beyond social development of children who tend to solve their problems by fighting. <laughs> well, anyway, I, I, I just asked her to bring that up because she said that to me when she came in. Uh, so why don't we close on, on maybe a positive note. Um, here's the political reality in Washington, D.C. The Senate has a 50-50 split. Um, so, so Democrats are at the gavel because of uh, Vice President Harris breaks any time. Um, literally cannot lose one vote. Cannot lose one vote. And so that requires one person starting over here, three and a half trillion dollars, but wants it to for the people from our part of the country. Because there's, you know, I, I meet a few people who um, I, I are, feel extreme, but most of the people I meet are, are just hardworking people. They want to be right by their families. They want their kids to be able to be better than they've done. They want their grandkids go to good schools, make sure that they're healthy. And so I, I think that's what is required um, in order to get anything through because, you know what, we're, I, I, I once had a, a person I worked with who said, don't use the word normal because nobody really knows what normal is. But, but I would say, I think we're just pretty normal people around here who just want what's best for our families. And um, back to your question, I, look, I, I take my job I don't take myself seriously. I do take my job seriously. Uh, it's a 
really the greatest honor of my life to be able to serve in this congressional district to have had support from so many people where we're now. We'll have a new member of Congress who I hope will do the, the same thing on your behalf. Um, but uh, thank you for, for coming out tonight. I have to say the crowd was bigger than I was expecting. I thought maybe we'd have 10, 12, 20 people. So thank you very much.